I see I actually had a baby recently. This is my baby. So this also is maybe to convince you that you came to the right place, someone that knows something. So this is the book that I wrote. And yeah, it was a 10 year pregnancy. And then an eight pound baby came out <laughs> last fall. And there's actually another volume, which is the references. So there's another book this thick of the references, but it was too expensive to just print 10,000 references. So that's all electronic. So really, it's bigger than this. So I'm really proud of this. This is my great achievement. So this is a textbook for, for doctors about gastroenterology and how to see it from a completely different point of view. So how to see digestion from a natural point of view. Now, sometimes you need drugs and surgery and all that stuff. But I think a lot of you know that that should be like the last resort, not the first thing people do. So it has all that in there, but it also has all the things you do to avoid getting to that point. Uh, so I'm very proud of this work. And um, I do, I love to, to share my knowledge with my students, obviously, with other doctors and with everyone. I just, I want people to know this stuff. I don't want it to be a secret. I don't want it to be some, something that you just heard rumors about, you know. So definitely part of the format tonight is if something comes up, if you have a question, please just bring it up. I don't, you don't need to wait to the end to have some formal process. I'd rather it sort of flowed. And I've got a few things for us to do during the talk um, where you can be a little bit involved. Or if you are shy, you don't have to be, you know, you can work on your own or whatnot. But um, I just find it so much more appealing when you can be a little bit involved at least and it's not just endless talking. But here we are to talk about digestion, uh, something that is just critical to health. I, I think, again, a lot of you probably have a good idea of that or you wouldn't be here. And it's something in naturopathic medicine that we spend a lot of time talking about and thinking about because really if you're not digesting well, you're not absorbing well, it's hard to do anything. You, know, you, you are what you eat, as they say, or you are what you aren't, what you don't excrete is, the, is the another way of putting that. So I'm going to talk about several different aspects of digestive health. And um, there may be other topics that come up. If, so if you have a question about something you don't see happening or coming, feel free to ask about that too. But I wanted to sort of start with the gloomy picture that uh, is really why there's so much trouble with this, which really I don't think this is a genetic issue or anything. This is definitely are the problems with digestion in our society are caused by what we eat and how we live. And so we often talk about the standard American diet, which has this lovely acronym, uh, which of course no other civilization in the world eats like we eat any traditional civilization. Uh, we've, we've kind of taken every rule of how we should eat and we've broken it. And I really believe that is because of simple facts, money and profit and power and control. And it's sort of funny all, the, all these things that are happening now with the Wall Street protests and stuff because we could be doing all that with the food industry too. It's just absolutely despicable. If you haven't read um, Fast Food Nation or seen Super Size Me or all these other great documentaries coming about how bad the food industry is and how many problems and just how that's creating such a mess. I'm also going to bring in sort of the politics of how chemicals are affecting how we eat, uh, how affect our weight. And lots of issues are coming up now about toxicity and food that we kind of knew this stuff, but it's even more and more science coming out. So this is important. Um, this bad diet that people are eating and you know the stressful lives we live and lack of exercise, it's all coming together in this really bad way. And so I want to change that. I want to, want to fix that. So the basics, yeah. A lot of this tonight, hopefully you'll be saying like, well, duh. You know, it really should be, I think, obvious. And, but hopefully I can also add some more support and details to some of these obvious things uh, to further deepen your knowledge and help you spread the knowledge to other people. And I really love this formulation by Michael Pollan. Who's read any of Michael Pollan's works or seen any of his works? Any of you don't have your hands up, go out and buy everything he's ever written and read it tonight. 
because he's great. He's a great writer, does a wonderful job. So this is kind of his like capsulized summary of how to eat. And I've just added one word, which is the word clean. So he says, eat food. Actually, I want to put an S on there. Mostly plants and not too much. Brilliant advice. So I really felt it was important to add clean in there because this issue of organic and the chemicals in our foods and what do those do to us. Um, and I'm mostly not going to touch on the genetically modified organism issue tonight because I still feel fairly ignorant about it. I'm very concerned. I, know we, I think we've all seen some reasons to be concerned about that. But that could take up a whole other lecture, it seems like. So we'll see if, we, if people are really dying to get into that. But I will certainly talk about organic. So eat food. People eat plastic today and act like that's normal. I, one of my nutrition teachers had this great way of looking at it. He's like, people are willing to go into Safeway. How safe is it? One is left to wonder. And they buy bottles with ingredients that they literally cannot pronounce, and they have no idea what they are. And they're made of petrochemicals. So they're eating oil, or they're eating plastic. But they would be terrified to go into the woods and like pick a blueberry or something off a bush in the woods, because they're like, well, what if some animal defecated on it? Or, <laughs> or I don't know what they're afraid of. It's like we've lost our connection to nature. And that's what this eat food is about. It's like going back to what is food? It's not plastic. There's actual things that we eat that are food, and we've forgotten what that is. You know, like a lot of what Americans eat 100 years ago did not exist. Like it was not on this planet. We invented it. Someone invented it. And another way Michael Pollan says, like, is your grandmother wouldn't recognize it as food, it's not food. You know, <laughs> like, and that's probably even a little too conservative. Like, it probably needs to go back a couple generations from that, because really we started seeing white sugar and white flour well before that. And these are industrial products. They exist to make money for companies. They do not exist for health. They do not exist for wellness. They do not exist to help people. They exist to make money. Even all these products that are list labeled as you know, low fat and healthy and you know, most of that stuff, it's exactly the opposite. It's not even food. It shouldn't even legally, I think, be able to be labeled food. Mm -hmm. If it contains plastic, I think the label should say plastic you know, or oil. Like, let's be honest about what people are eating <laughs> instead of dressing it up in these complex chemical names. So one of the most important things for digestive health is to eat food, actual food. And we're going to also talk about diversity of food, because one of the other problems with eat food is it's become this incredibly narrow set of foods. And that's creating a whole nother set of problems. Mostly plants. This gets into a different dimension here. And it's not, I mean, certainly that has an important health aspect we're focusing on. But there, again, is this political dimension that animal foods are a lot more energy intensive to create. They generate a lot of pollution. And I'm not anti-animal products. I actually eat meat myself. Oops, I just did the thing I said I wouldn't do. I can't hit the microphone. But um, there's a lot of political problems with animal products. So we'll talk about you know, sort of doing that in a better way. And not too much. You know, This, of course, is just epidemic in our society. We eat too much. This makes a lot of sense biologically. We know, you know, sort of looking at how we used to be 10,000 years ago, that you never knew when you were going to starve. Starvation was absolutely fundamental to human life. <laughs> you know, there was no guarantee of a food supply. So this, I'm basically talking about before agriculture was invented, and 10,000 years ago is about when that kind of started, as far as we can, you know, know. So what that means is, we are biologically hardwired to eat too much. Because you never know when you're going to be starving. And we're also biologically set up to store that food really well. And some people talk about this, and they call it, oh, what's the word for this? Um, the thrifty genome. That in fact, these traits that are now kind of hurting us really were very protective of us 
back when food was you know, something that you couldn't count on. And so now we might even argue that people that, that are the best at keeping weight on are the best survivors. You know, 10,000 years ago, they would have held on to their, what calories they could get. So when, they, when starvation came, they were best able to deal with it. And it's kind of flipped on its head now. Now we have ample food. There's no problem with supply. It's available year round in basically unlimited quantities in our society. And so we continue to have the drive to eat and consume like we always had, but there's never going to be that starvation. <laughs> so the not too much is, means we kind of have to be aware of this and kind of rein it in so that we stay out of trouble. So I thought I'd start off with hunger. And steps to good digestion definitely involve issues of hunger and overeating. So this is also, I think, an important topic because gets back to if you want to have healthy digestion, it's important that you are connected to nature. And that includes your own body. We are natural beings. You know, our bodies are natural. And our drives and our hungers are natural. And as we get more in touch with them and understand them, that helps. I think a lot of problem with overeating and with hunger in our society is that we ignore our actual urges and our actual hunger. We don't eat when we're hungry. We just eat when we're supposed to. You know, the clock says it's noon. It must be lunchtime. You know, and our, our work life is very regimented. Our school is very regimented. You know, everything has become set on this clock, which is not really set to our biology. <laughs> and so that causes, I think, hunger to become this very abstract Thing and it starts to become very emotional, and it does not support health anymore. It just creates problems. So a big thing for me with health is to get back in touch with when you're really hungry and eat when you're really hungry, but also that you don't need to eat until you're stuffed, until you're so full that there's no chance of any hunger whatsoever. That probably the best advice is you should stop eating when you're still a little bit hungry. And as you train yourself to do that, it's very difficult, by the way. This is maybe the most difficult thing I'm going to suggest tonight. But if you can do that, if you can get to a place where you're, you leave the table still a little bit hungry, it will go a mile. For one reason, because what that almost certainly means is you won't eat dessert. Now, I love sugar. Who doesn't? like sweet things. I have actually had patients come and say they really don't eat sweets. And I know some people that are not big sweet tooths, but we're generally a sweet loving people. And it doesn't do us any good. You know, there really is nothing good about white sugar. There's very little good about honey or molasses, even though they're like natural sugars. Um, they're just their problem. So if there's one thing that you're going to do tonight for your diet to gain the most benefit, I really think it probably would be cutting out simple carbohydrates. And that I'm definitely including honey, molasses, because there's nothing good about them. And you can kind of think about it from even before it gets to your mouth. But focus on health. Like the instant it hits your mouth, right, it's hurting your teeth. It starts going down into your digestive system. It causes all kinds of havoc with the bacteria in your digestive system. You absorb it. It causes all kinds of havoc with your insulin and your blood sugar. Like there, every single step of your body, it's bad for you. <laughs> you. You know, your body turns sugar into fat. That's where the fat mostly comes from in our bodies. It comes from sugar. It doesn't come from fat. Now we can absorb fats and we can store those. But mostly our liver, our lovely, lovely liver, takes all that sugar and makes it into fat and says, I better store this up for the future because we might be starving next week. You're not going to be starving next week. So. You want to sweeten something, something up. What would you use? So difficult question. If you want to sweeten something up, what would you use? So part of my answer is don't sweeten it up that really a big part of this is to get away from that 
drive to eat sweets. But the simple answer is fruit. Uh, but then, you, you know, it still is easy to eat unhealthily sweet fruits like bananas. You know, we all love bananas. Bananas are really sweet. They have a lot of sugar in them. And they come from far away. You know, they're not very sustainable. They're a monocrop. Like, bananas are the worst monocrop in the world. There's one species, one subtype, one variant of banana that's the commercial banana, the Cavendish banana. And that banana is on the precipice of total extinction. It's already been infected by a microbe. I can't remember if it's a fungus or what. In Australia, it's totally gone. You can't grow bananas in Australia anymore, Cavendish, because this microbe just kills them all. And now it's in Asia. You know, like, we're, we're not going to have Cavendish bananas in 10 years. I'll make that prediction right now. They will be gone. Now, they might genetically modify Cavendish bananas, <laughs> but then it'll just be the next one or the next one. But funny thing about that, there's over 1,000 species of banana. 1,000 species. And we're eating not just one species, but one like sub, sub, sub version of it. So there's all kinds of other problems with, with bananas. Um, anyway, but berries would be the local fruit of choice, in my opinion. We've got blueberries, cranberries, raspberries, blackberries that grow prolifically in the Northwest. They're so easy to grow. We've also got elderberries. How many people have eaten elderberries? People know that one? It's a little bit of an acquired taste, but I don't know why this is not more popular because one of the beauties of elderberries is that it fights influenza, helps protect you from getting respiratory infections, and it's yummy. Although admittedly, with a little bit of sugar, it's just that much better. So, God, you just can't get away from sugar. Uh, maybe just a little bit of honey, just brighten it up. Or mix it with some blueberries, because blueberries are a little sweeter. Um, so that's a good dessert. And actually, what's also nice about the berries is they freeze. They don't lose their nutritional value when you freeze them. So you can store them all year round and still have a really nutritious thing. Another good story about blueberries, there's recently been two studies that have come out that show that blueberries help your insulin to work better. And that's really important because then your body can use sugar much more efficiently. So blueberries really are kind of one of these superfoods that we hear about. Um, they're, yeah, like we know, they're just really common Northwest food. So yeah, if you're feeling like you really just want to have a little something sweet, go for the blueberries. Now I also want to mention two hormones that they've discovered related to hunger. And one of them is called leptin. And one of them is called ghrelin. And ghrelin is the hormone of greed. That's how I kind of remember <laughs> which is which. And leptin, so ghrelin is made by your fat tissue in your body. And it basically says, you're hungry, eat more. And the leptin, or ex actually that's not right, excuse me, the ghrelin is made more by your digestive system, and the leptin is made by your fat. So actually your fat is sending a signal saying, don't eat. We're full, we got plenty of stored stuff in here. So the leptin is supposed to be calming your body down. The ghrelin, though, is telling you you're hungry. So when you ignore your hunger cycles and you live with this regimented cycle and stuff, you're basically your body's ghrelin goes out of control. And you're making too much of it constantly, and that makes us constantly hungry because we've lost the cycles of nature. So the ghrelin overwhelms the leptin. So actually, your fat is trying to help you. So love your fat. We, you know, everyone rub your tummy. Like, come on, fat. You're trying to help me. You're doing your best. You're sending out the leptin. The leptin is saying, stop eating. We're fine. We don't need any more. But the ghrelin is winning. So the eating better to your hunger and trying to follow the cycles of nature better is an important step to rebalancing those two hormones. But also getting off the sweets helps because sugar really seems to throw this balance off. And then the other huge component of this is sleep. Another critical component to good digestion is sleep. It's all connected, right? <laughs> Big surprise there. But 
we know that people that don't sleep well or don't sleep at all, uh, people that work the night shift, these have huge impacts on digestive function. And in particular also to insulin and our body's ability to deal with sugar. Um, it's really thrown off by sleep. And you know, electric lights play a role in that. It's kind of another way we've really gotten away from nature. Now I'm not anti-electric lights, let me tell you. But we do have to wonder about how some of these things affect us. So it really is true that you need eight hours of sleep a night as a general rule. Some people are different. I, you know, that's not to say if you don't get exactly eight, you're breaking the rule. But most people sleep too little. I'm guilty of it from time to time, to be sure. And we also don't sleep in the dark. You know, even when you have the lights off in your bedroom, usually there's some light coming through the shades. You've got an electric alarm clock. You know, we live in a, in a light polluted society. And we know that even the light from an electric clock radio is enough to suppress your normal melatonin synthesis. Just that tiny little bit. Your brain still thinks you should be awake. And what's really weird is that they did these studies where they showed that shining light on the backs of people's knees threw off their melatonin. And when they figured out why that was, it's because we have tiny little receptors for light floating around in our blood. So our whole body is a light sensor, not just our eyes. So we need to sleep in total blackness. And it is a real chore to do this. I actually remodeled my whole basement <laughs> and moved my bedroom into the basement. I know everyone likes to live up on the top floor and you have these beautiful vistas and you open the doors in the morning and there's Mount Rainier and the herons and, no, yeah, wait, we live in the city. Um, and there's the buildings and the cars and the freeways and, um, but we need total darkness. So get rid of your clock radio or cover the face of it. Have thick, heavy drapes. And, you know, the closer you can get to total darkness, the better your sleep will be. And then the better your digestion will be. Now, another thing is don't eat too late at night. Well, first of all, this is way out of the cycle of, of nature. Like, you're not supposed to be hungry at bedtime. And what happens when you eat late at night is your digestive system is working at night. You're supposed to be sleeping. You're not supposed to be digesting. So this is like the worst possible thing. Plus, it can cause reflux or GERD or heartburn because you're laying down after you eat. And there's just a million reasons not to do that. I don't understand. Uh, uh, um, why would you need all your blood to digest in versus blood to sleep? I mean, where's the... A lot of things are, yeah, a lot of things are happening during sleep. So you may be unconscious, but your body is very active. For one thing, our kidneys are actually fairly active when we're asleep. And so that's interesting. Um, also, of course, our immune system is like really peaking when we're asleep. And we've often noticed this, you, you, know, you know, when you're sick, what do you want to do? Run a marathon? No, you want to sleep. <laughs> yeah. And why? Because your body really goes into sort of this hyper healing mode. So there, and then of course our, our brains are like going crazy and we're dreaming and doing all this processing and we still don't even know exactly why that is. But so your body needs its resources to do that other stuff. And if it's digesting, you're taking away from it. Uh, it pretty much should be three to four hours before you go to sleep, sort of ideally. So that pretty much means your stomach is empty. Now, there's always going to be food in your lower digestive tract. That's just pretty much constant, unless you are actually fasting. And that's fine, because the colon is more sort of a slow digestive organ. But yeah, three to four hours is a usually a good margin for most people. If you're really having cravings, at bedtime, or I've even had patients that, that have this thing where they sleep, eat, you know, they, they sleep, walk, but they get up to eat, or anything like that. Uh, it's true, and it's, it's a real problem, you know. Um, then you should definitely seek help, because there's some herbal things we can do to help break that. I don't feel totally comfortable with people trying to manage that, but occasionally the other thing is to just have a little bit of protein containing food. 
So a, a few nuts or a little bit of jerked meat or like part of a boiled egg. Because a lot of times when we're hungry, it's a blood sugar fluctuation. And if you fulfill that with sugar, it just gets worse. It's like you, know, you throw the rock in the pond and the, now you're making ripples. Instead, if you have a little bit of protein, it kind of quells that hunger, it doesn't set off insulin, and it's way more balanced. Uh, but just don't have very much. Just have a little tiny bit. So that's a tricky thing. All right, another great thing to help your digestion is to eat bitters. And no one likes the taste of bitter things at first. Well, no, I shouldn't say no one. I exaggerate. But uh, mostly we consider this bitter taste to be a bad thing. And it kind of is a protective thing. If you're going to go out in the woods and just randomly start tasting things, most of the poisonous stuff tastes bitter. So that's part of the rational reason why we don't like this taste. But there are many beneficial medicinal things that are also bitter. And the only bitter food that's common in the United States is coffee. But what do we do to coffee in the United States? Yeah, we, we drown it <laughs> with cream and sugar and flavorings and syrups. And it's like if you drink lattes, you like milk. You don't like coffee. <laughs> you know, if you drink whatever, these flavored coffee drinks, you like sugar. You don't like coffee. So don't tell me you love coffee if you drink those things. That's, I tell my page all the time. Um, so if you're going to drink coffee, drink coffee. Coffee is a good, healthy food. I think that is now firmly established. There was kind of this period where even naturopathic medicine, we were kind of anti-coffee. There's a dark side to coffee. <laughs> Get it? Dark side, black coffee. Oh. I thought that was a little bit funny. Um, which, of course, is the stimulant nature of it. So that can be abused, and you can drink too much coffee. But coffee is bitter. Coffee stimulates digestion. That's what bitters do. Can you get the same benefits from decaf coffee? Just like you can. Benefits? You can get the same benefits from decaffeinated coffee, absolutely. And actually, you can get the same benefits from green tea, which has some different compounds, but it definitely has bitters in it. Black tea has still some digestive stimulant effect. Uh, so you have a lot of choices. And, and chocolate, although again, we tend to drown chocolate in sugar, so it's a little bit of a problem. Um, so what I have up here is our humble dandelion. You may recognize it from a yard coming near you. But the, the roots and the leaves of dandelion are actually really great foods. And they definitely taste bitter. So they're not something you need to take gigantic amounts of. But they stimulate your digestive system. And it's amazing. They start in the mouth stimulating things. And they stimulate all the way down the digestive tract. Now, it's not so much that it's like you're going to be having diarrhea all over the floor or something. <laughs> I don't want to get too over-exaggerated of a stimulating picture. But they get the digestion going. This is a big problem because we're not exercising enough. When we sit a lot, we're all guilty of it. And I'll talk a little bit about why I say that. Um, our digestive system slows down. Like, it really is directly connected, and especially we've shown this with the gallbladder. Like when we sit a lot, our gallbladders kind of fall asleep. And that leads to a whole bunch of problems with gallbladder disease, and kind of explains a lot of things. But the average, so we have some data about how much exercise people used to get. And one of the best sets of data is from traditional people in Mexico. So these are traditional farmers. They make their entire living from subsistence farming. They don't live in a city. And they walk an average of 40 miles a day. I have never walked 40 miles in a day. I rode my bike once 16 miles. That's the biggest trip I've done. I mean, who walks 40 miles a day? Even if you go to the gym for an hour, you're not even touching that. So we're all sedentary by historical standards. Now, I'm not advocating for us all to get out to walk 40 miles a day, because you know that takes a huge amount of time. So things have changed. But we have to keep that in perspective 
So one of the ways for our digestive system to compensate for that is more bitter foods. And so coffee is one. And, and so for a good level of coffee, if you're having it caffeinated, is two cups a day maximum. And again, it really should be black coffee. We know now especially that black coffee is really good for the liver. And there's kind of this thing that happens, um, which I already sort of alluded to, where your liver, your liver does a lot of things for you. I'm going to keep bringing up the liver, liver, liver. And I don't know how many of us have good liver connections. But. Uh, I love the concept of this. Two cups of coffee, so this is Seattle. <laughs> yeah, not two buckets of coffee. <laughs> 16 ounces of coffee. Two eight ounce cups. Good. Thank you for bringing that up because that is really important. So you mentioned green tea. It's like, it's like two tea bags of green tea a day. Uh, you probably want to end up doing more like four tea bags of green tea if you're going to do it with bags. But yeah, that's, that's in the realm of very helpful. So your liver is taking the sugar, turning it into fat, and then eventually there's too much fat. And you know, your body is storing it all the places we know where fat can get stored. But the liver also says, oh, I'm going to try to save the body. I'm going to soak up some of this fat. And you get something that's called fatty liver. And this is not good. This is what happened to the guy in Super Size Me. He showed, or now this syndrome is even has a fancy name, fast food hyperalimentation. Like if you eat McDonald's three times a day, or any fast food three times a day, you gain enormous amounts of weight very rapidly, and your liver goes crazy. It just totally freaks out. And part of it is just so much fat coming in in that case, but some of it's the sugar. Anyway, the liver is trying to store all this fat, and it gets clogged, essentially. Well, the coffee actually helps it clear that out. So now we have a couple studies showing that. So there's also studies showing green tea and coffee both protect the liver from a variety of toxic insults and things. So, so coffee can be healthy, done right. I, I guess that, that therapy for cancer and stuff like that, that they use coffee and the stuff and I know people think those are kind of weird, but as a matter of fact, you're saying that running your coffee actually has... Yeah, and in the Gerson cancer therapy, they're also using the coffee in a little different way when they do the enema, where it actually binds onto toxins and kind of soaks them up. Um, so they're not so much talking about drinking it that way. But yeah, there's, there's other things about coffee that are potentially good. So, but you can overdo it. You know, if you're having to drink more and more to stay awake, you're overstimulated, well, it's because you're not sleeping. Like if you need a stimulant to stay awake, it's because you didn't sleep. Or you maybe hate your job. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll leave that one aside. <laughs> Fix your digestion, quit your job. So anyway, one thing I want to say about bitters is that because we, are, we partly have this sense that, oh, bitters are bad, they taste bad, and also we kind of get that message reinforced, it really takes a little bit of work to stick with bitters and get them into your diet. But literally every patient that I've worked with who has done bitters consistently, all of them come to like them. Not just tolerate, but actually say to me, you know, I actually kind of like it. So it's a very much an acquired taste. Now, you don't have to do a lot. A little bit of bitter goes a long way. So even just a couple of leaves of dandelion can be enough in a salad to do this. Arugula is another kind of bitter green that everyone's probably heard about. That's a sort of famous one. Uh, but the dandelion root is also bitter. There's another food you can get. Um, you know, at Whole Foods and PCC and places, that's the, called gobo in Japanese, or it's burdock in English, which is a close relative of dandelion. And we eat the root of this. And it's less bitter than the dandelion. So if you're having a little trouble, you can cook with this. So it's got a rooty, earthy taste to it. So it's kind of like sweet potato more without the sweet. Uh, so you can cook with it in soups. You can. Uh, put it in a stir fries. It's a pretty easy ingredient. Oh, I thought you had a comment, sorry. So burdock root's another bitter one, but lots of green things. And that's why a lot of people don't like green vegetables, is the bitterness in there. 
have you guys heard of this concept of a super taster? Has that come into anyone's consciousness here? Well, it turns out that some people have a little genetic quirk. I hate to call it a mutation or anything like that, because who's to say we're normal? And basically, they, they can taste certain compounds way more than the average person. And this has especially been shown with broccoli and cauliflower. They have these compounds in them, which if you like broccoli, tastes good. But if you're a super taster, it tastes awful. It's like this overwhelming bad taste. So some people don't like broccoli, and it really is legitimate that they don't, because it has such a strong taste to them. Anyway, for, so I'm, part of the reason I'm bringing that up is that if, you, if at first you don't like a certain bitter, don't throw the whole thing out. You know, like there's other bitters to try out there, and maybe you'll like one more than another. So the classic thing in Europe is that they would sip bitters in alcohol and a little aperitif right before they eat. And that was for a lot of reasons, which are so important. One is you need to relax. Digestion is an act of relaxation. You're, when you're digesting your body's nerve, the part of the nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the one that helps us relax, is active. So if you're driving, running, racing around, trying to eat, your digestion isn't that good. So having a little bit of something bitter before you eat is a reminder, oh yeah, I need to stop, relax, at least take a couple minutes to eat. There, there's something called bitters that I think has to do with alcohol. Yeah, exactly. You can go to the liquor store. Angostura bitters or Swedish bitters, you can say, I'd like some bitters. And they will bring out these bottles, and there you can buy those. And they have herbs in them that are intensely bitter. So you literally might only need like five drops of that put in some water, is sipped it, before your meal. Is it a liquid? Or yeah, it's a liquid. It doesn't have little bitter buds or anything? No, we've basically put the, we stuff the herb into alcohol, let it soak for two weeks, and then we strain the herb out, and it's extracted all these bitter molecules into the alcohol. Any liquor store, it's everywhere. And any health food store, because it's, they, we call them tinctures in the health food stores and in, in our dispensary places, but it, they also call them bitters or Angostura bitters. And there's all different kinds of herbs that do that. But I'm also advocating to bring it into your food and not necessarily have it be that separate thing, although that's one way to do it. So yeah, it's a, but it's a reminder to, to also relax. Yeah. Absolutely. And then yeah. also like the dandelion leaf, that also comes in a dry form. You can just throw like a teaspoon of that stuff in there or whatever. Absolutely. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you cook the dandelion leaf too much, you'll destroy it. Like it's not very strong. So that would be more like on a salad or at the very end of cooking something. But the root has a lot, you know, it's a lot tougher. It'll hold its bitterness longer. So that could actually be really cooked in. So eat bitters. So we already have too many rules. I know there's a lot of rules here, but they're, they're really just suggestions. Uh, so we definitely want to relax, want to have bitter foods in our diets, we want to watch our natural cycles. And then the bacteria. Oh, question. Why is bitter a bitter in the digestion? I have no idea. Because yeah, why bitters? Yeah, so that's a slightly different thing. So caffeine itself does relax the lower esophageal sphincter, um, but it's not the other bitter compounds in there doing that. So that's, that is kind of a funny thing with the bitter coffee and tea. But they increase salivation, they increase hunger, they increase acid production in the stomach, they increase the movement of the digestive tract, like all these other components get stimulated. And why? I don't know. It's some evolutionary, hilarious, strange thing. Another thing that's interesting about bitters is we have like known like 40 different receptors for bitter tastes. There's only like two sweet tasters, one salty, one sour. Like we are hyper attuned to bitterness. Now again, that's obviously because we're trying to protect ourselves from some of these plants that are actually toxic in nature. 
But it also has led to our ability to really appreciate these, these beneficial ones. And yeah, they just, all of them, all bitters stimulate digestion. They all have that effect. So it's real interesting. Is that what the uh, fennel seeds do against the end of the Indian meal? So fennel seeds actually do the exact opposite. Fennel seeds relax the digestive system and kind of calm it down. So if you've just had a super spicy meal, which is very stimulating digestion, it's sort of like calm that down a little bit. So, yeah, but still a great thing to do if you're, especially if you have trouble with spicy food. How are we doing on time? We're pretty good. All right, this is something that I'm really, really on fire about. Um, bacteria. Okay, here's our interactive game show item number one for the evening. Mm -hmm. It's called Guess How Many Bacteria Live in Your Body. Oh, Trillions, that's a very good start. Trillions of bacteria. Who wants to try to put a number on that? How many bacteria live in your body? I'm, and this is really just mostly talking about the colon, but some of them are on our skin. 20, 20, trillion. 20 trillion is actually too high. Wow, that's like one of the first times I've had people guess too high. That's amazing. Amazing. Getting very close. We think somewhere between 8 to 9 trillion microbes. Okay, now another interesting question. How many human cells are in your total body? It's more than billions, although I guess you had enough billions that would eventually add up to that number, yeah, but who else has a brave guess? Okay, so first question, more or less than the bacteria? I'm kind of, that's kind of giving that away, aren't I? There's fewer of us than them. We estimate about a trillion, a thousand billion. So we're 10% human and 90% microbe. When I learned that fact in naturopathic medicine my first year, it completely blew my mind. I'd never heard that anywhere else. I'd never heard the numbers. And I've never been able to let go of that fact. Like that is mind boggling for so many reasons. First of all, when we talk about understanding our bodies and we don't talk about these microbes, we're completely fooling ourselves. Like we should be focusing all our efforts on understanding these microbes. There's nine times more of them than us. <laughs> Just on sheer numbers. And there's like thousands of species. And it's not just bacteria. I've been kind of trying to say microbes because there's fungi in there. There's something called archaea, which are even more primitive than bacteria. So the, the microbes living in our guts are incredibly, incredibly important. And that's finally starting to sink in in conventional medicine a little bit. But I still see lots of people put on antibiotics with absolutely no mention of the effects on their gut bacteria or other microbes. I see just a total lack of understanding of how important this is. Now, and even still, I feel like I have only the most primitive knowledge and it's something I've been studying for years because we just generally have poor knowledge of this. Now, and actually one of the most interesting puzzles, I think, is how do these things get in our bodies? Like, where do they come from? No one has ever been able to really prove how they get there. You know, you think about it, like you're in your mother's uterus. You're not connected to her <laughs> digestive tract. Like, where? <laughs> it's sterile in there. There aren't bacteria floating in somehow, except we think maybe not. There's some evidence that, in fact, these microbes are in the uterus and that they're naturally there and they, we basically eat them when we're in the uterus. That's one theory. And then it used to be thought, well, we got inoculated when we passed out through the vagina when we're born. Well, of course, now in the United States, 30% of children are not born naturally. They're surgically removed. <laughs> and so there's no way for that to happen, but they still get these microbes. So the last place that they come from is what we eat. 
And that's really what I think. And even breast milk, but you know, we still don't know. It's kind of a, it's kind of a miracle. <laughs> and I'm not a particularly religious person, so it's like, and then magic happens, and 90% of the cells in your body show up one day. You know, like how does this happen? So, but food is a clearly an important source of these these microbes as we go through our lives. Now, every traditional culture that I've looked at with any amount of information, they, they eat something fermented. Like they intentionally let bacteria grow on that food. In the Northwest, it was actually fish heads. They would ferment the salmon. And this stuff is nasty, <laughs> I have to say. I try to control my cultural biases, but I just can't get past fermented fish. I'm sorry. And I guess the Norwegians do that too, the lutefisk type thing. Who's had been around any of these things? I don't know. It's more for you. It's more for you. I'm going to stick with fermented cabbage because that's what I really like. <laughs> but good, good. I'm glad people like that. Um, now, fermented food is really important because another important fact about these all these microbes is most of them cannot tolerate any oxygen. These are anaerobic bacteria and other microbes. Oxygen kills them. It's another mystery, like, well, how are they getting into our bodies? Like, there's oxygen everywhere. <laughs> it's totally mysterious. But uh, so mostly in our colon, there's no oxygen. There's tiny little bits of it. So most of the bacteria are anaerobic. Well, you've probably heard about these probiotic capsules, and probably a lot of you have taken those. Those, my, those bacteria in those capsules are exposed to oxygen. So the lactobacillus, the bifidobacteria, like the microbes that we can take in capsules are really, I like to say they're bit players. They're just these absolutely minor microbes in the gut. I'm, and to give you a sense, it's like they're, we could count them in the billions. So while those have a place and we've shown they have a beneficial effect, that's not going to cut it. And that's why they don't always work. It's because those are not the bacteria and the other microbes we really need. We need these anaerobes. Well, to make a capsule impermeable to oxygen is very expensive. And that's why we don't get the microbes we need from those capsules, really. So the only way we have to get it, well, there's, there's kind of two ways. I'm going to mention one other way really briefly, even though there's a pretty strong ooh factor. Uh, it's pretty interesting. But one of them is through our food. Another one is through dirt and eating soil. And right now we have this like obsession with cleaning everything. And fermented food is meant to partly break that. Like You need to eat some things that are dirty. And I'm not talking about contaminated. I'm talking about they have dirt on them. Like soil is normal. We're supposed to be eating soil. There are microbes in the soil that are in our guts. And they're totally natural. Now, if that soil is contaminated with cow feces, that's when you start getting these terrible problems. So it's industrial agriculture that has made things be so problematic. But there is a third way that is a medical way. Oh, question. If the soil is contaminated, with, there are bad things that can be in soil, that's for sure. And we've put lots more into the soil with all of our behaviors. Uh, so I'm not necessarily advocating everyone run out to the street out here and get up a, a scoop of dirt. But we're talking about organic farmland. You know, it's not downwind of things. And they've kept cows and you know, certainly non-organic cows, et cetera, out of there. It's, for the most part, really good. I, I personally think that's untrue. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't claim to know about every microbe in the world that might be out there. But my strong impression is that, especially when we have the ability to make our water supply clean, which they didn't in you know, 10,000 years ago. There was contamination of water. But because we can get these scary microbes out of our water supply, that can make our soil especially good. But we know that everyone traditionally ate dirt. There was no way to avoid it. And that that's part of the microbes 
And part of why I'm saying this is that there, are this, there is this match. But I wouldn't say it's a perfect thing. None of what I'm telling you is, is perfect or without some slight risk at least. So that's good to, to bring that up. So the third way, which is the kind of ooh way, is from human feces. And one of the therapies that's now being developed is basically to give people a transplant of someone else's bacteria. Where they do this is with Crohn's disease right now, which is a very severe disease of the gut, where basically the person's gut flora has become so abnormal that their body is attacking it. And this can kill you. You know, it's very severe. And what they found, there's a researcher in Australia who's pioneered this, is you can give them, those people, healthy bacteria from another human that has no disease, and they recover. Now, this is usually given by an enema, or they can do it during a colonoscopy. Um, so anyway, there's nothing, of course, that you're going to do at home, but I just <laughs> want to put it out there. <laughs> Uh, I'm not advocating to eat feces, oh my God. But just so you know that there's other levels of this. But let's go back to fermented food. I should have never even talked about that. Um, so the way you can get anaerobic microbes into your body, besides the ooh way, is through food. Because food has particles where the bacteria can go in where there isn't oxygen. Deep, deep inside these food particles. Now there's not very much... So when we're eating fermented foods, we're not getting big doses. So that's part of why this has to be kind of an everyday thing. So you're kind of getting a little bit every day. If it's just once in a while, eh. The probiotics, one of the benefits of the pills is you can take a huge dose all at once. And I think that's part of why they are successful when they're successful is just the sheer amount. So fermented cabbage, I think we're fairly familiar with sauerkraut. And then also from the Korean tradition, we have kimchi. And there's actually many types of kimchi. There's some of you think of the spicy, most common type, but there's actually a whole bunch of different types. And I had the great fortune to visit Korea and got to taste many types of kimchi. And so there's a kimchi for every palate. Um, so sauerkraut, and then there's other types of fermented vegetables. You can actually ferment almost anything. Of course, fermented dairy products would be the other one that's super common in our society with yogurt, kefir, cheeses, and all those have good microbes in them. Um, now here's some of the problems. Because we have a mass industrialized society with billions and billions of people, we do have a lot of problem with food contamination. And that means most of what you buy that's fermented in the marketplace has been pasteurized, which means all the bacteria were killed. And so if it doesn't say live <clears throat> culture on your product, you're not eating fermented food. Although one little side note is killed bacteria, dead bacteria that are good bacteria, still have a benefit in our bodies. They've shown that that does especially seem to help our immune system beneficially. And that includes in preventing colds and flus, decreasing allergies, um, some other immune thing. Oh, and also for autoimmune diseases. So even if you have a capsule of bacteria that are all dead, that still has benefit. It's not as good as when they're alive, but there's still something. So our immune system is talking to these so-called talking, even if they're dead. <laughs> we can talk to the dead. I just thought of that. <laughs> That's amazing. Like there's chemical messages that go back and forth between the live microbes and the dead products, and that communication is really important. And we don't hardly even understand how or why. But um, so make sure your products, if you're buying them in the store, say live culture. You can also ferment at home. And this is the wild fermentation movement. Don't you feel like you're out riding the range even now and you're just thinking of it? Wild fermentation. So there's several books and websites. And basically, you just chop up your vegetables and set them on the counter, and stuff grows in there. And there's lots of discussions about how to control this, have it not be bad stuff, because bad stuff could grow in there, and how to know if it's gone bad based on odor and things. Um, anyway, that's how bread got invented. Like, someone left some wet flour out overnight or grains and in the morning they noticed 
gas was bubbling out of it and it kind of swelled up and they figured and it was just because yeast flew in from who knows where and landed in there and poof it happened you know think about bread what a what a crazy thing that is all this you have to knead it and it grows and you have to heat it and it grows and then you know how did that get figured out it's an absolute miracle that that got figured out but so the yeast in bread are a little bit like a probiotic but maybe a little more problematic um, there's not a lot in beer. Maybe you're all thinking, hey, I'll just drink a whole bunch of beer because that's fermented and I'll just drink a bunch of liquor. Well, of course, most of it is gone. But yeah, if you drink a nice, dark, bitter beer, that's got the bitter. It's got the yeast in there. Like there are some good things about that. I think it tastes terrible, but to each their own. But just again, you can't really over, you, you don't want to do a lot of alcohol because alcohol has side effects. But the other things in the beer are good. Other things in the wine, yeah. So when you, when you just soak like oats before, you know, like if you're making oatmeal the next day, if you just sort of soak the oats overnight, that's kind of fermenting too. Right? You get a little you bit. Soak the rice, yeah. soak, all the, soak all the beans. You know, there's, yeah. there's fermentation. You get a little bit. It really usually takes more than one day yeah, to get I mean, any significant amount. It's, it's fermentation starts because there's stuff coming out flying. That's right. It's just in the air. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, in fact, the, there's a good book that's just called Wild Fermentation, and that's a really good resource if you're interested to learn how to do this safely. Um, so a lot of the recipes that we do for fermentation call for like whey and whether you do salt. Do you know how that's helping the palate? I'm not totally sure, but yeah, the acid really particularly seems to prevent harmful microbes from growing. So that's why a lot of fermented foods have vinegar or some kind of sourness to them. And the salt, same thing. Um, but yeah, I don't... I don't know for sure, and, but certainly that it holds up to a long tradition. So <laughs> let's definitely stick with that. So yeah, eat some fermented foods regularly. And I would say mix it up. Don't have like the same thing over and over. I'm going to talk about that again um, shortly here. But really, really healthy and good for us. Oh, organical, organical food, <laughs> organic food. That little molecule there on the screen is malathion, which is used both as a mosquito killing agent, but it's also a pesticide sprayed on foods. It's really bad for you. It's really bad for you. Uh, there's so much information coming out on the problems with pesticides and herbicides, it's overwhelming. You could spend your whole life just reading the papers that have been written and not even get halfway through. You know, it's just overwhelming. So I'm just going to mention two kind of topics here. One is this new idea of what they're calling obesogens. So there are actually very good human studies showing that certain chemicals cause obesity. They throw off our hormonal levels, including that leptin-ghrelin balance, and they cause this kind of insatiable hunger. And in particular, organochlorine pesticides, which are a slightly different category than the malathion. Um, but you know that these have substantial risk of causing obesity and that they're showing up in study after study. And the studies on chemicals causing diabetes is even more frightening. So independent of effects on body weight, pesticides promote diabetes. And we don't even know all the mechanisms of that. But again, we've got many substantial, well-done studies supporting that. So you can dramatically lower your burden of these chemicals by eating organic food. It really makes a difference. Oh, I forgot to mention the other category I wanted to say, which are called xenoestrogens. Not to be confused with xena estrogens, <laughs> which makes you be like Xena. No, I don't know. Um, so these are artificial chemicals that look nothing like estrogen. You know, their chemical structure is totally different, but they act like estrogen in the body at very low concentrations. And even scarier now, they've shown that if you have two of these compounds in your body, at levels below the estrogenic level, but they're both there, they work together and they will act like an estrogen. And we're talking about tiny amounts. 
And for a long time, this has been the counter argument like, oh, organic food, that's so quaint. That doesn't matter. The amounts of pesticides are so low, it can't possibly hurt you. Well, then they did a whole bunch of studies on those amounts of pesticides, and guess what? They hurt you. Yeah, we don't hear about that. We don't hear about that, but it's in the literature. It's in the scientific You're literature. The first one I've heard say that, you know, talk about these things or whatever. I mean, it's not out there like, you know, you read the Seattle Times, you know, every day I know. religiously. You don't see that in there. Yeah. You know, yeah. eat organic it's, food. I mean, the logical conclusion is to eat, well, organic food. Yeah, exactly. And you know why that is, because there's a lot of money to be made on the chemicals and in the grocery business, et cetera, on non-organic food. So that's really squelching it. But it's, it's out there. So these xenoestrogens throw off our, our hormones in our bodies. So um, in men, it's like you have too much estrogen in your body. It can contribute to infertility. We're worried about that. Something called cryptorchidism, where the testicles don't descend right in boys. Um, there's concern about it being a factor in causing prostate cancer. We know they're related to breast cancer. Um, and all kinds of whacking out hormones in women and causing cycle problems and maybe polycystic ovarian syndrome. There's there's a lot of problems, and they're churning these chemicals out every day. There's still the laws around when you can release the chemical are incredibly lax. Maybe you do and I don't know. Um, my husband used to shoot nalafion and a bunch of those things. And uh, we had an infertility problem, and they told us in 1981 that they were doing a study on Agent Orange and guys who worked in pesticide factories and finding out that it, it, it affected the fertility. And they didn't have a study on those who shot them as jobs. But I was wondering how much of that kind of stuff affects me having done all the laundry. <laughs> I think a lot. Yeah, I think there's huge exposures. You've probably all seen those pictures. I guess they were from the 60s, maybe the 50s, where the trucks would drive around town spraying malathion and other mosquito killing agents just on people. Yeah. 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 Water and salt. No, it's definitely <laughs> pesticides. I was actually in the, the main hospital in El Salvador in 1992, no, 1994, and there was a dengue epidemic. So they came through the hospital. This is like Harborview, and they were just spraying DDT on everyone and everything, just right on the patients. <laughs> it was unbelievable. By the way, there were also do feral dogs wandering around in that hospital. Wow, we have it good in the United States. But we also have lots of bad things like these chemicals, which are sold as this great boon, and they cause a huge amount of problems. And I don't know the answer to like the food, the amounts of food we need to grow, that pesticides allow that to happen. But I know that we're paying a huge price for that, that it's not acknowledged. So anyway, you can reduce your exposure personally by eating organic food. They did this study here in Seattle they actually had researchers stand outside of PCCs, and I don't, by the way, work for PCC, they don't pay me or anything like that. And they had people stand outside of Safeway, I also don't work for Safeway, quite the opposite. And they would ask people, can we basically take a biopsy of your fat and measure your pesticide levels? And you'd be amazed how many people said yes. <laughs> like, think about for yourself, like, right here on the street. Now, they obviously went and took them to a clinic where it was safe, but, so they looked at the levels of these chemicals in their fat, which is where it really matters, right? If it's in your blood, that's kind of bad. But if it's in your fat, it means it's stored in your body for years. And not surprisingly, the PCC shoppers had like 80% lower pesticide levels than the Safeway shoppers. I mean, it was huge, the difference. Uh, there's lots of other research that now clearly shows eating organic food makes a big difference. But I'm not a total Puritan, and I also try to be pragmatic. Like, if you have a choice between eating a carrot that's been sprayed and a candy bar that's made out of plastic and sugar, you should eat the carrot. <laughs> you know, like, some of these choices are not difficult. Like, I'd much rather you ate a can of peas with sugar and salt in it than drink a can of soda pop. Like there's, a, I, I'm pragmatic. I would rather you eat vegetables, <laughs> even if they're not organic, because that's still way better for you. But if you can do it, and to the extent you can do it, organic food's good. The area where I think organic is actually the most important is animal products. 
because they, you know, animals are the top of the food chain. They're, they're concentrating these chemicals from their own food. And so you're eating really a toxic time bomb if you eat a non-organic animal product. So that's, that's a big problem. Just go ask the orcas. Like, why are the orcas in so much trouble? It's because they are the top predator. And they're eating top predators. You know, salmon are major predators. And those are eating all these other fish. So it's just concentrating the chemicals up the chain that are just getting in the water because humans are so you know, toxic. Well, yeah, but if you're an orca and your whole diet is salmon, it adds up. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah if, you, if you eat exclusively salmon, wild salmon, even you'll get very sick. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's so sad. Okay, try to stay upbeat. Organic food. Food diversity. So another way to really help your digestion and prevent a lot of problems is to eat a wide range of foods. And so here's our next interactive game show moment, which is to just take a minute and think back I don't know, the last few days, maybe the last week, I mean, that's hard enough, but think of all the foods you've actually eaten. So I'm not talking about like I had spaghetti for dinner, like I want you, so if you had spaghetti, it's like you'd write down wheat, tomato, onion, like the ingredients. Like think of all the ingredients you've eaten. Just start to make a list on whatever. You can do it in your mind, you can do it on paper. You guys are probably not the best sample. You're gonna blow this out of the water. It's a fun exercise. Actually, another fun way to do this is to kind of keep a life list of all the foods you've eaten. Like bird watchers keep a list of all the birds they've ever seen. That's a very interesting list. I'm very into keeping my, my food list. So we can add our wine, chocolate, and things like that. Yeah, that. yeah. And definitely things you drink. I know the hardest thing is just remembering, what did I eat yesterday? <laughs> two days ago? What did I eat two days ago? I'm going to think about that for one minute. <sighs> what you'll start to find as you keep this list, unless you're an extraordinary person, which I hope you all are, is that you eat an incredible lack of diversity in your diet. You know, we really do have staple foods that we eat constantly. So recently, I figured out that I can't eat wheat. And I definitely have problems in my body when I eat it. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to cut out wheat. And it was like this, someone pushed over the dominoes. It's like, oh my gosh, wheat's in that. that which I already knew, of course. I'm, I'm school in that. I've done this diet with people. But when I personally started thinking about it, it's like, wow, I eat a lot of wheat. It's in everything. It's everywhere. Like, if that isn't like the top third, fourth thing you wrote down, you're really different, you know, <laughs> like, or maybe you have been avoiding it, which is pretty common too, but um, a special thing about wheat, just as a side note, is that there are proteins in wheat that break down to these short peptides, like seven to eight amino acids that are basically like morphine. They go into your brain, they bind onto the same receptors as morphine, and they make you high. So we are absolutely addicted to wheat. It's a brilliant strategy when you think about it. Like what plant is more widely planted than wheat? Like wheat wins the plant battle, right? Or corn is giving it a run for its money. But it's like, yeah, make humans addicted to you. Poppies, you know, like those are common crop. <laughs> So um, these compounds and the compounds like that that I know of have been clearly identified in cow milk and in wheat. Now they may have shown them in other foods too. And I'm trying to think of the word. They have a word that they call these things. Exorphins. 
So our endorphins, you've probably heard of those, right? Those are our natural opioid compounds, but these are exorphins. So you can research into exorphins in food and how we're addicted to wheat. But so what I have up here are three foods that I thought maybe no one's ever eaten these. Maybe they have, but um, maybe this is probably the one most people eat. And this is taro. Has anyone had poi or other taro products? So I thought, yeah, probably people have had that. But how many, do people have that every day? Is this a staple for anyone here? Yeah, if you lived in Hawaii, it would be. And now this one maybe is not so likely, but this is prickly pear cactus. Anyone had the pleasure of eating this? A couple nods in the audience. So the fruit of this is actually truly delicious. Now it is covered with these little, uh, both depending on the species, they can have spines, but also what are called galakid hairs. So be careful if you're harvesting cactus. It can look okay, you can't necessarily see these things, but if you eat them, they will cut your throat and it's really bad. So uh, you have to either peel them or the classic thing is also use a blowtorch and like burn the hairs off. Because uh, it doesn't take much heat because these things are just very filamentous. Anyway, the fruit is, it's absolutely delicious. And even though it's sweet, there are many studies showing it actually lowers your body's insulin and, and is good for you, helps fight diabetes. But the pads of this are called in Spanish, are called tuna. Like the fish, we say tuna in Spanish, that means the actual green round pad of the prickly pear cactus. That also is really good for diabetes and it was a major staple in the Southwest and it's good. It's kind of gelatinous, a little bit sweet. And you can get that in markets that is around Seattle. Hispanic markets and Asian markets both have that. And then this is lotus root. How many people have gotten to have some lotus root? Delicious. Wonderful, and it's beautiful. When you cut through it, it's got these big vascular canals, so it's got like these five holes in it. It's really beautiful. It's got a nice, earthy, sweet flavor to it. So by eating lots of different foods, you do something really important, which is prevent food allergies. One of the consequences of our very non-diverse diets is our immune systems seem to get sick of these things, and we get a lot of problems with our common foods by eating what's sometimes called a rotation diet, meaning just more diversity and not the same thing every day, you help prevent that. So diversify your grains, diversify your vegetables, eat weird things, eat bugs. I didn't even bring in the bugs, but we desperately need to start eating insects. Like, they're so good. Oh, yum. Crickets are delicious, by the way. Exorphins. No, that has nothing to do with gluten intolerance. That's a different protein in the wheat. Um, and well, and true celiac, it is the actual gliadin molecule, which is a part of gluten. But people can react to other things in wheat too. But basically, it's a different phenomenon. So. Yeah, I, I urge you to keep your food list of everything you've ever eaten in your whole life to kind of compile that, which is a fun exercise one evening. Just sit down and, oh yeah, on that trip I took to Hawaii, what did I eat? What was that? Like I took the trip to Japan. I still don't know half the things I ate. I have the <laughs> Japanese names, but I have no idea what they are. So I feel good about that. And then yeah, just trying to diversify things. When you go shopping, spend some time in that vegetable section. Just like, what is this? I'm going to figure out how to cook this. I'm going to try it. See if I like it. Of course, in your own gardens, also growing a diversity of things. Uh, but aren't there nutrients like in, in gristle and, and uh, in you know, parts of, of meat or animals that we don't ordinarily see in a grocery store? Uh, and like the tongue and liver and, and but, I mean, like gristle and, and, and eyeballs and, and you know, uh, yeah. blood and, and those things that traditionally we don't eat here. Skin. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're missing out on all the glorious <laughs> organs <laughs> and other things. Um, yeah, there really is, I think, a lot to that. And it, but it also kind of goes back to the connection with nature. Like, if you're going to eat an animal, eat it. Don't just have the pretty parts. And I even got so far at one point to say, if you are not willing to butcher an animal, you don't have any right eating them. So I have actually killed a chicken and a rabbit which was the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Um, but so I feel that I have earned the honor of eating animal products. 
Um, but you know, it's just it's such a disconnect from reality when you just get this thing that doesn't look anything like what it was. So I'm not that radical. I'm not going to force you to kill a chicken. <laughs> Yeah, we used to eat a lot of things raw. Again, in our mass culture, it's a lot more dangerous because we don't know where it came from. But the more you're able to control your food supply, the better. So I wanted to end with chewing. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie, uh, read the book, Road to Wellville, they talk about Fletcherizing. That was like this all the rage back in the 1800s, which basically meant to chew your food. Um, for a while, they actually thought chewing was bad, and they kind of train people not to chew, which is just insane, of course. Um, so chewing ha really helps your digestion. Chewing is where it all starts. Well, actually, it starts when you look at your food and smell and stuff. But then the chewing is critical. So I just looked up, I just did a search on in PubMed, the Index Medicus on chewing. And I found in five minutes the following studies. Um, elderly people that chew better have better balance. They fall down less. Now, yeah, how does that make sense? Well, they're, they're absorbing more nutrients. Their nervous system works better. Yeah, maybe it's some of their inner ear nose, but they're, you know, we could theorize all day, but it, that's what they found. Chew better correlates with better balance. Um, people, so they took a group of people that were overweight and a people that were thin and they had them chew. So they said, now, some of them, you know, they switch back and forth, but either chew 40 times for each bite. How many people have tried to do that, by the way? Is that incredibly difficult? 40, it's like, I'm going to die. <laughs> or 15 chews per bite, which even that is a lot. And what they found is when people chewed 40 times, in both groups, they ate way less food. So if you want to decrease your hunger, chew. Lots. It really works. Not just because you're like working so hard, but it really seems to, to balance those hormones. But also, they found that just naturally, people that were overweight chewed a lot less. So it really is a simple way to do it. Again, these are just, these studies were all published in 2011. You know, there's hundreds more. Um, chewing decreases your insulin response to foods. So if you're going to have something sweet, Chew the crap out of it, because then you have less metabolic impact on your body. Chew, chew, chew. Get that candy bar into a really, really thin soup in your mouth. <laughs> and not surprisingly, older people who lose their teeth start to eat way fewer fruits and vegetables, and that directly correlates to higher rates of heart attacks, strokes, Alzheimer's. You know, it's like so. You start thinking about these simple things like chewing can have profound influences, not just on your digestion, but on your, your whole body's health. Whew. OK, that was a lot. I really hope that you don't feel like I've been lecturing you, even though I've been lecturing, or moralizing. I don't mean to, to do that. I just really want to point out that there's a lot you can do. There's a lot of angles to come at better digestion. and but also, it's, it really is fairly simple. And so eat lots of vegetables, chew them up, organic as much as you can, ferment some of them, don't eat too much. You know, it, doesn't, it doesn't take a genius to figure these things out. But it's, it's hard. I know it's hard. So just take little steps and continue to improve. But I'll take any other questions here. We've got a couple minutes. And Oh, maybe I didn't even get to it because I'm just so excited to talk about this stuff. Oh, what else is great about blueberries? Um, they freeze well. They're local. Help your insulin response. Um, oh, they prevent bad bacteria from sticking to your bladder and to your intestines, just like cranberries. Cranberries and blueberries are really close cousins. So they're a good food if you get urinary tract infections frequently or um, if you're traveling and you get exposed to strange creatures. Uh, yeah, I don't know what else I was going to say. 
There's almost no downside on the blueberries. So, what, so I know a little bit. Uh huh. So, generally, dehydrating is good. Of course, it's really important that it's done with moving air and not heat, because it's heat that destroys things. So, most dehydrators, it's because it's got a fan that keeps things circulating. That that's why they're so much better than doing it in a traditional oven. Mm -hmm. But assuming that, it's basically good. Yeah, the more vegetables we can get into people and fruits that are, the better, pretty much. I haven't seen a lot of specific research or anything, so I couldn't say a lot beyond that. One food I will put a plug in for, um, for digestion and immune function that will do really well with drying are mushrooms. Actually, mushrooms get stronger the more you process them and the more you cook them. And the, I like to say to my students, like, run them over with your car and then chop them up, stomp up and down on them, cook them for three days, and then they're potent. Now, fresh mushrooms are, are fine, too, but they actually get more and more immune strengthening with time and with age and with processing. So what if you just you know, kept them a while before you used them? So Great. Any kind of form of age. Yeah. Yeah, so when they like get all dried out and weird in your refrigerator, that's good. <laughs> Don't throw those away. Now, if they get slimy and moldy, okay, that's, they're not fermented. They're gross. But yeah, dehydration. Other questions? If you're or, juicing, if, uh, like ju not juicing, but um, putting stuff in a blender and blenderizing it, does that still have, I mean, if it's a whole whatever, like spinach, you're still going to have that nutrition, but is that going to, I think, what, does it, is there a downside to blenderizing? Mostly no, yeah, if, if, as long as you get everything, because yeah, with traditional juicing, you lose a lot, so yeah, when you grind things up, that's fine, and actually, that, you know, arguably releases somewhat more nutrients to do that. There's kind of a reason that we cook things and blend them and chop them. But on the other hand, it can lead to excessive calorie intake. So make sure, because, you know, it's liquid, so you're not chewing it at all usually, um, just to keep that in mind and kind of balance that. Is there an issue with kale um, eating it raw versus cooked? No. Raw kale is fine. In fact, one of my favorite dishes in the world is finely chopped kale with Kalamata olives chopped and interspersed and then a little olive oil and a little bit of salt. Heavenly. Love that. It's delicious. Well, thanks everyone for coming and happy digesting. Take care. Thank you.